Hi, I'm Debbie Gabler Spira. I'm a pediatric physiatrist at the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab, formerly known as the Rehab Institute of Chicago. And I'm Christina Marciniak. I'm an adult physiatrist at Shirley Ryan Ability Lab in Northwestern University. Today we're going to be framing the issues surrounding the study that was recently published in Developmental Medicine and Child Neurology entitled Pain, Spasticity in the Adult with Cerebral Palsy. First, I want to thank you, Chris, for being the go-to transition doc for all the patients that I have referred to you over the years. Uh, we uh, certainly came of age in the same era of aggressive spasticity management. And it's nice to be able to talk to you today about how um, the aggressive management or hopefully the appropriate aggressive management of spasticity and tone in children framed your care for adults with cerebral palsy. First, I wanted to ask you, um, we both know that pain is a very complex problem and that it's very common in adults with CP. Uh, how do you perceive spasticity relating to pain in the adult with cerebral palsy? Well, I think both of those uh, issues are uh, common in the population. And the question is, you know, usually when a person comes in and wants some kind of intervention for their pain, it's trying to figure out the pain generator, just like an adult who does not have cerebral palsy. However, the underlying tone makes it much more complex because you can't do your usual musculoskeletal exam at the knee or the hip if there's other things that are uh, providing resistance. You can't necessarily position people without causing more pain or even position them in an appropriate position. So I think they're related and I always have a problem sort of sorting out the issues. But I do know when we treat spasticity, we seem to get better levels of pain. And so the question is, um, is it because the spasticity is contributing perhaps to the musculoskeletal problem? Or is it primarily the spasticity is generating the pain? I don't, I don't know that we still have the answer, but we're trying to sort things out with our study. Very good. And um, we did have an ideal situation where we had clinic time that had overlap space. And for the patients that were being transitioned, frequently we had that opportunity to have a joint meeting with the family, the patient, to talk about what management strategies were used in the past and what could potentially be used going forward. Um, do you have a sense of um, the adults who come to you without the previous pattern of spasticity management, if there's a difference between those two groups of patients? I think uh, the adults I see that are in the community setting, they don't necessarily see providers that have any familiarity with cerebral palsy. So that I think is a group that um, has a lot of needs and may have had care that um, maybe did not contribute well to their, uh, you know, problems with pain and spasticity. Right. I right. think that's the biggest, that's the biggest um, problem I see. Right. Um, I always think that a very good transitional um, opportunity exists to uh, utilize the adult rehab providers. Um, and I, I really, hope that uh, the adult world in physiatry will embrace the, the childhood disorders. Um, how do you go about uh, promoting that even within your practice? Oh, I, I don't know if it's within my practice. I think it's with working with you, Deb. For all these years, we've been trying to sort out all the issues for adults with cerebral palsy because there's so much that's not known, which is, of course, why we started doing a number of research projects in this area, actually even trying to define the prevalence, the questions, right? That, the, what are the right questions to even ask? Right. So um, I think, we, you know, we've accomplished some with this and with others, and, um, but we've got a lot of things to do. Right. And I remember, the two of us are never going to get to them. So we've got to identify those people that are interested in this population generally.
Right. I think uh, when I think about this study, it raises more questions than answers. And it really does beg to have a larger uh, data um, uh, collection so that we have a small number, we try to use precise measures, but then we know that there is such practice variation and variability within the population that a mechanism such as a uh, big data network will really uh, be important to provide uh, the numbers of patients that need to be included to really understand a complex problem like this. I totally agree because there's a lot of heterogeneity within uh, the adults with cerebral palsy. And so, you know, trying to identify it with a small number, I think, and in a one institution could definitely, you know, impact results. Right. Thanks, Chris. I think it's time to hear from Megan. She'll explain the study, uh, she'll explain how we did it, what we found, and how we can hopefully uh, expand this in the big data network. So thank you, Chris. Thanks. Hi, this is Megan Flanagan, and I am a pediatric rehab fellow currently at Seattle Children's Hospital and University of Washington. I'm here to talk about the paper we published on spasticity and pain in adults with cerebral palsy. This was a cross-sectional study of individuals with CP with inclusion age of 16 to 89 that were recruited initially for a parent study evaluating factors affecting activity and nutrition in CP. Participants were seen by one of the two experienced physicians you just heard from, who performed examination, including measurements of hypertonicity, and provided questionnaires for participants or their caregivers. Medical records were also reviewed to confirm patient reports of prior surgeries and medication use, including spasticity medications and pain medications. We excluded any patients with concurrent severe neurological or medical diagnosis and participants with major limb amputations or pregnant or lactating women. We looked at five primary variables for this study, including two pain variables and three hypertonia or spasticity variables. The pain variables included the brief pain inventory short form or BPI, looking at average pain over the past week and the PROMISE pain interference short form, looking at adjusted T-scores comparing our participants' responses to general population norms. For hypertonia, we looked at the Penn Spasm Frequency Scale, or PSFS, where participants or their caregivers recorded frequency of spasms on a scale of zero to four. We also had measurements of the modified Ashworth Scale, or MAS, and the Tardu scale, looking at spasticity angles. Both of these hypertonia measurements were taken at bilateral elbow flexors, wrist flexors, and knee extensors, and these were then summed. Our two pain variables and our three spasticity variables were then crossed and used the Spearman rank correlation coefficient to determine correlation. We also used the univariate linear regression models to determine if associations existed between these scales as well as with age. Multivariate regression models were also used to adjust for age and pain medication use. Pain and spasticity scores were also evaluated by GMFCS level using the Kruskal-Wallis tests and Kuskik's non-parametric trend test to look for trend. Of the 47 participants that were recruited, seven individuals required caregiver report for these questionnaires. These patients were fairly spread out between the GMFCS levels, as you can see here, and significantly more patients were quadriplegic compared to hemiplegic, diplegic, or triplegic. 36 of these patients were currently using spasticity medications. Of these, three had an intrathecal baclofen pump, 21 were on oral baclofen, and nine of these patients were on multiple medications. Twelve of the patients were using pain medication. 
This could include NSAIDs, gabapentin, or SNRIs. None of these patients were on opioids at the time. 23 of the patients had had prior musculoskeletal surgery on either the hips, knees, feet, or wrists, and only one individual was known to have an SDR, or a selective dorsal rhizotomy. The three measures of spasticity were compared to the two measures of pain. Preliminary results showed a statistical correlation between the PSFS and BPI, as well as with PROMISE. For each one-point increase in the PSFS, the PROMISE pain interference scale T-score increased by 3.24 points, and BPI average increased by one point. When adjusting for age and pain medication use, this remained significant, but we also found a new statistical association between the MAS and the BPI. However, the slope was only 0.13, which indicates a very weak clinical significance. There was no other significant associations between these groups. We did find that age was associated with BPI, so an increased age showed increased pain measurements, but not on any other measure. And the MAS was different in GMFCS levels, with a trend of increased MAS with increased GMFCS level. There were no other significant differences in measurements across GMFCS levels. Like Dr. Gabler and Dr. Marciniak said, we understand that this is a small group of individuals, all treated at the same institution with aggressive tone management, so this may not be representative of the general population of individuals with cerebral palsy. For instance, this group did not report increased pain interference compared to historical norms on the PROMISE questionnaire, which contradicts what we know from clinical experience and previous research that indicates higher levels of pain in patients with CP. It would be helpful to do a multi-site study of a larger group of individuals with CP to get a more representative group and help to determine if there is a correlation between spasticity management and pain in adults with CP. Thank you.